Hello and welcome to the 38th episode of the Ultimate Health Podcast. My name is Jesse Chappis and I'm here with Marnie Wasserman. Hi guys, I hope you're having an awesome day. We're excited to uh, have an episode between Jesse and I today. Yeah, it's been a while. This will be fun. Marnie and I are going to share a bunch of great information with you guys. But to start, we're going to announce the winner of the contest we've been having for the last couple of weeks. So this contest, for those of you that don't know about it, we are giving away $100 worth of Four Sigma products. So we're going to give away some of their mushroom teas. We're going to give away some of their chocolate shots. And we're going to give away some of their coffee, their new coffee beverages that are mixed with different mushrooms. So there are three different products they have out right now. We're going to ship a box of each to the winner. And we... Coffee is uh, so potent. Have you been drinking it, Jess? I've tried a few of them. I really like it. I was I was off of coffee for a couple of years, but all their products are instant, which is great. They're all in sachets that are individually packaged, and you just rip the package open, add hot water, and you have a hot medicinal mushroom beverage that has so many different healing properties ready to go. So... Recently, I tried their coffee there a few times, and it's it's delicious, and it's just, just a great way to start the morning. It gives you that boost, and obviously, with any caffeinated beverage, it's all about balance, and you don't want to go crazy and consume too much, but in moderation, these are really healthy, great drinks. And I'm not a coffee drinker, but I love the company so much that I had to try it just for the sake of it. And honestly, like one sip and it like went right through me. But uh, it's um, the taste. I have to comment on the taste. It was so good. And I can't wait to remake it. What I'm going to do is because I'm so sensitive to caffeine is I'm going to make a batch of it, divide it in half and then take some almond milk or rice milk and maybe some coconut nectar and make a latte and dilute it. And I think that's probably the best way that uh, I'd be able to drink it. Because I like, I actually do like the flavor of coffee, but the caffeine just doesn't sit well with me. So I'm all for their reishi and chaga packets. That's that's what I love. Awesome. So what we did, we gathered the iTunes reviews over the last couple of weeks. And, and for the people that sent us emails, we put everybody's name in an app I just got for my iPhone called the Randomly. And this app is designed for teachers and they can put their class in and and then randomly it'll pick one of the students by pressing a button. So after we put everybody in, we hit the button and the winner is Rochelle Muscroft. So Rochelle, we, we have your email and we're going to reach out to you and get your address, and you're going to get a delivery of $100 worth of those Four Sigma products. So, Yay, congrats, Rochelle. Congrats. Hopefully, you can share a picture if you're on Instagram or social media of your order when it comes in and, and your first drink you make out of it. Yeah, show off what you get. <laughs> make everyone jealous because it's good stuff. Four Sigma, honestly, it's such a legit company. Jesse and I just stand behind it. Everything from their packaging to their branding to the actual owners behind it, who we know personally, is uh, is of total um, of integrity. It's amazing. Yeah, super clean products, super medicinal yeah, they taste good. They're easy. And uh, yeah, we, we love them. So what we're going to get into next is our win of the week. And I'm going to let Marnie start off and get into uh, what we got up to this week. Yeah, we're trying to really kind of whenever we can mention what we've done that's all within the ultimate health philosophy. And this week, of course, there's so many things that Jesse and I do during the week, but we're going to highlight one of them. And this week, we participated. Well, Jesse mostly participated in the march against Monsanto that happened all through the world and definitely in Toronto yesterday. And I came for kind of the after party after the event where there was lots of vendors downtown Toronto. But uh, what an amazing thing to have take place where people are taking a stand against Monsanto, which is... 
To, to break down Monsanto in a nutshell, it's an agribusiness company that has dominated the agriculture of farmers and has used biotechnology to manipulate crops and seeds. And it has just caused so many problems and there's so much backlash. So people are taking a stand. We want control over our food, know what's happening. We want to support farmers who are doing things legit, organically real. We want that type of food in our body real food not franken foods so that's uh so jess how was the march yesterday it was great and i mean for me the biggest thing is having these things labeled so we're all free to make the choice of consuming genetically modified foods or not at this point this is a relatively new thing coming up with these foods. So what they're doing is they're taking genetic material from one organism and inserting it into another. There's some early research showing that there's associated birth defects, cancers, but I think more and more as time goes on, we're going to really see a lot of different negative effects from these foods. And our friend Julie Daniluk, who we've had on the podcast before, was there kind of spearheading and emceeing the event yesterday. And she was wearing a tomato costume with a fish going through it because that is one example of what's being what's happening to our food is that they're taking genes from fish and putting in a tomato. Now, how delicious does that sound? Not very delicious at all. It's pretty scary. It's pretty creepy what they're doing. So it was just really fun to see her uh, dressing up and kind of showing people with a visual of what's actually happening to our food system. Yeah. So for this March, like Marnie said, it went on throughout the world, different countries, and uh, hundreds of thousands of people were involved, everybody on the same day. So this just took place yesterday, and uh, we just march throughout the streets of Toronto and just put out the good word of making people aware of GMOs and making people stand up for their rights and stand up for the fact that we need to know what's in our food. Yeah, and uh, Jesse and Josh Catalis, who we also had on the show, were uh, wearing t-shirts yesterday that said, hey, GMOs, get out of our plants. Is that what it said? Hey, GMOs. Yeah, please, please get out of our plants. <laughs> it's so cute, so fun. So if you check out Instagram, you'll see, uh, and Facebook, you'll see some pictures of them. It was just super fun and a nice way, again, to just uh, get the message out. Yeah, and the way this is taking place, it's a nonviolent, very positive event. So we're we're out there just raising awareness. Like Marnie said, Josh and I were together. We We had planned to do this thing together for some time. Josh got those shirts made up. And we were lucky enough to be right at the front of the march and we were holding the uh, March Against Monsanto sign. And and like Marnie said, Julia was there wearing her tomato fish costume and she was right up front too. And and we just had a blast. We, We ended in a nice park in downtown Toronto. They had all kinds of amazing guest lectures and musicians. So it was a whole day of fun and there was all kinds of great vendors there selling non-GMO foods, health foods, and we just had fun. It was a sunny day. It was great. And it's nice because that's becoming a norm also worldwide is that not only is the organic certification on foods becoming, you know, more present for people to be aware of, but so is the non-GMO label. And an organization that I want to bring attention to is the non-GMO project who's doing wonderful things to make sure that there are standards set and that companies can now get that label, which you'll probably see the non-GMO project. And it's a little like butterfly in a blue label going onto products. So it's nice now that this is what we're demanding. We want to have the right to be able to choose and know if GMOs are present in our foods. And luckily, there's so many products now that are GMO free and you can find them easily. So at, yeah, the vendors yesterday were great. And just so that you know, if you're shopping around at your local store, wherever you are in the world, that uh, you have the right to ask or know. And hopefully that uh, the products that you are picking up are visible to you, whether they have GMOs in them or not. So the great thing is a lot of countries are adopting laws to have GMOs labeled. Canada and the U.S., two huge countries, unfortunately have no laws in place. So again, personally, what I'm hoping is that we can at least get these products labeled and people are free to make the choice. And you might come across, I know 
being in the health world, I come across this uh, infographic quite a bit saying that if you see the code, you know how there's the four or five digit codes on produce that you see at the grocery store on stickers. So just so you guys know, anytime there is a five digit code with the nine in front, that means the product's organic. So wherever you're at, a lot of times some of the signage might be wrong at the grocery store or maybe there is no sign. When you see that nine and there's that fifth digit, you know your product you're buying is organic. And organic is important for so many different reasons. But the one thing in US and Canada right now, if you're buying organic, you can be certain the product is non-GMO. And like Marnie mentioned, there's also labeling going on, which is great too. But organic is next level. Yeah, so look for that nine in front of the PLU code is what they call it. And then if you have a four digit code with a four in the front, that's conventional produce. And supposedly, but Marnie and I have never seen this before. If there is a five digit code with an eight in the front, that's supposedly for GMO crops. But there's definitely a good chance. Let's put it that way, that a crop has genetic modification going on and the produce you're buying has some genetic modification if you're buying conventional. So that would be the one with the four in the front. And then I also want to bring light to the crops that are most often genetically modified. And some of you may be aware of this, but things like corn and soy are two of the most uh, genetically modified crops out there. So any derivative of soy that is not organic or labeled as such is likely genetically modified and it creeps up into so many things, so much more than just tofu and soy milk. Like there is, you know, soy lecithin, there's soy, there's soy fillers, soy isolates from proteins. There's so many versions of soy that can be found in products. So you really have to take a look at that. And same with corn as well. There's so many variations of corn. And if you haven't seen the documentary King Corn, which I highly recommend that you uh, get your hands on that to really understand what's happening with corn and how much of our food system is actually dependent on corn. So we need to buy organic corn. And, you know, from my philosophy, I believe that corn is something kind of in modern moderation as it is. You know, popcorn's delicious. Jesse and I love our popcorn. And maybe once in a while in the summer, getting an organic uh, spear of corn is nice. It's just not something that really adds too much value to our diet other than, you know, just a bit of a starchy veg. But if you can buy organic popcorn kernels and make your own, but you got to watch out for these crops. You got to just be mindful of that. And there's so many more that are out there, but those are the two main ones that infiltrate our system. And Marnie mentioned the documentary King Corn. Personally, I haven't seen it, so I'm going to throw that on my wish list. We're going to have show notes over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 038. So we're going to have a link to that documentary, links to everything else we're talking about on today's show, and a summary there. Just, Just as always, just so you guys can relax and a lot of you are out and about so you can just go home and and check the website for any information you need. Well, since we're on that, I'm looking right over on my shelf right now at GMO OMG, which is a recent documentary that uh, Jesse and I just watched. And that's a really wonderful one just on what's happening with uh, genetic modification. It's about a family and it's really interesting just to see the way that uh, the son's involved with the saving his seeds and it's just it's really eye-opening so that's a great documentary so we'll add that to the list yeah there's so many amazing health documentaries out there these days i try and keep aware of what's coming out and and watch as much as i can but i can't even keep up and that that's a great problem to have because word is getting out and people are becoming more aware of their food and their health so i'm really excited about that Yeah, for sure. So let's maybe talk about the importance of, we've talked about GMOs, but you know, you hear organic this and that, and you hear Jesse and I probably talking about organic all the time, but I just really want to shed light on the importance that it is to incorporate as much organic into your diet as possible. Of course, when it comes to things like meat and dairy, if that is within your philosophy and in your diet, those need to be organic. And then when it comes to produce, that's where sometimes a little bit more uh, education and uh, understanding is, is needed and required. And luckily, there is 
a wonderful resource called the Environmental Working Group that has put out a resource and they do update it every once in a while and it's called the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. So it's a shopping guide so that people can really look at which produce they absolutely should get organic and especially if it's something that they're eating regularly or serving to their family on an ongoing basis and then the ones that uh, that they can get away with having conventional. So right now, I'll just go through it. Why not? You, that way, you know, and we'll put the link on the show notes as well, but I'll just go through the dirty dozen. So this is what you want to buy organic. We've got celery, peaches, strawberries, apples, blueberries, nectarines, bell peppers, spinach, kale, cherries, potatoes, and grapes. And then Jess, do you want to read the uh, Clean 15? Sure. The current Clean 15, onions, avocado, sweet corn, pineapple, mango, sweet peas, asparagus, kiwi, cabbage, eggplant, cantaloupe, watermelon, grapefruit, sweet potato, and honey melon. So I noticed corn is on the Clean 15. I mean, like we talked about before, This is lowest in pesticides. There's so many different categories. I wouldn't recommend buying corn that's non-organic because, again, it could be genetically modified. There's actually quite a good chance that it would be. So different things to think about, but those are the lowest in pesticides. So there are so many different reasons why buying organic is important other than the pesticides. And we've talked about genetically modified. Another big reason is the fact that organic produce naturally has more vitamins, minerals, other nutrients when you compare it to conventional produce. And this comes down to another point. The soil is healthier when the produce is being farmed organically. So basically we use food for is calories and getting different vitamins and minerals. So your food's only as good as the soil it's grown in. And we want to make sure we're preserving those soils and organic farming naturally is better for the soil. Absolutely. And of course you want to also, you know, keep in mind the local movement. So You know, when we're looking at our soil and looking at local farmers, if you're going to local farmers markets or you have access to growing in your own backyard, you know, local is always best. And especially if you can get local or organic, that's that's 100 percent number one and the best way if we have access to that. If we don't, then we just need to be a conscious uh, asking question consumer and making sure that if you're going to the farmer's market, you can ask farmers, what are they doing? Is it sprayed? Is it not? What are you, you know, what are you doing with my food that I'm buying from you? So sometimes you will find farmers who who are going to tell you that they're doing as much as they can that falls within the organic paradigm. They're not adding anything. The soil's treated well, and but they don't have the funds or the money to totally certify their farm to become organic because it is expensive. So that's why it's good to find out. That way you can get firsthand information as to what's happening to your food. When it comes to a grocery store, it can be a little bit more touchy and uh, you may have to just you know, do the best you can and make the right call. And that's why just bringing back to local is also seasonal. So buying certain things in certain seasons will know that that food is going to have more nutrients, as Jesse said. So if you're buying strawberries in in the summer in North America, like they're going to be at their best. Whereas in the wintertime, strawberries ain't, uh, ain't tasting or looking so good. So just being mindful of all those things and really paying attention to your food. You don't need to eat this. I know a lot of people, my clients and even myself included way back in the day, eating the same thing all year round, just because, you know, I thought berries were healthy and I was eating strawberries all the time or tomatoes all the time, seasonal food. So really start to pay attention to that and your food will taste better and you'll feel better about uh, what you're buying. So when you can, always best to go to the farmer's market. You're going to get the freshest produce. You're going to spend less because the middleman isn't there. You're going right from the farmer to your wallet and, and you can save a lot of money that way. And like Marnie said, a lot of times people aren't getting certified, but they're using organic practices. So it's important to to head your farmer's market. And, and in Toronto here, 
there's a couple of great farmers markets and and most Saturdays Marnie and I will go in the morning and kick off our weekend that way and it, it's just we have a blast doing it and the food is top notch so yeah it's so much fun and so if you haven't done it yet definitely look out where the uh, local markets are in your area and uh, and ask your questions so a couple more reasons you want to stick with organic you're creating a healthier environment for the farmer and for wildlife so the farmer's got to go put all those pesticides on the crop and obviously that's going to negatively affect his or her health it's something i just want to jump back to quickly and uh not to go too much off topic here but we were talking a lot about gmos but one thing we didn't share and i think it's important just to address is from the gmo standpoint why they were partly created and why they think that they're doing a service is for world hunger, food production, food supply. So that's kind of some of the initiatives that were taken on for creating genetic modified crops and seeds. And really, uh, there's no research yet. And I've been doing a lot of research on this and there's still more to be done. And not to say that uh, either Jesse or I or some of the people who are doing avid work on this have all the answers, but Certainly, there's not enough support showing the benefit that outweighs the damage that it's been causing, which is why there are things such as the March for Monsanto. So we need to just pay attention to that. And I know that it's a controversial subject. So at the end of the day, you need to be your own resource and your own advocate and do like look into things so that you can have your own answers around this. And I think the thing to always come back to, like I said before, is the fact that they just need to be labeled. I mean, if they are solving a world hunger issue, great. Yeah, nobody's going to argue against that, but at least have the foods labeled so people can make that choice. So I think what Jesse and I really want to get into today and have some fun with is talking about green foods. So it is May here in Toronto, so it's the time that, uh, you know, we're knee deep into spring, summer's around the corner, the leaves have finally changed, it was a very long winter, things are becoming greener, we have, you know, we were just talking about growing and uh, and fresh foods and farms, so if people are growing their own food or going to the farmer's market, you're going to start to see more green foods come to life. And this is where I always start with, with my clients when I'm doing talks and workshops, this is a starting point for so many people because it's often overlooked is getting more green foods in for sure, but certainly the green leafy veggies. And that's definitely where Jesse and I are going to start today because of the wonderful nutrients that they can add into our diet. They're low calorie, high nutrient. You get a lot of bang for your buck. They're delicious. If you're getting, you know, organic, local kale or whatever you you have access to and that you love, it is a great starting point. They fill you up because of the nutrients in them. So you can have wonderful salads, soups, smoothies, juices. There's so many things you can add them into. They just provide so much nourishment. So you mentioned kale there, and kale is my number one green of all time. And I really like the micro kale, and you can find that sometimes pre-washed and organic in the plastic boxes in the grocery store. So I love to grab that up when I get the chance. But kale, kale is awesome. It's so nutrient-dense. I've grown to really appreciate and enjoy the taste, and there's just so many ways you can use it. One thing I want to mention is that I really like to, when I find a good kale, either at the farmer's market or at the grocery store, I like to buy a whole bunch, bring it home, not just one bunch, I mean like multiple bunches, and bring it home, give it a good wash, dry it out, rip it up into little bits and put it in Ziploc freezer bags and keep that in the freezer. It goes so well in smoothies. So you just grab about a handful and it's just quick, easy. And I find that the kale actually is a little less bitter in the smoothie once it's been frozen. I don't know if it's just in my head, but I definitely notice the difference. And there's so many different kinds of kale. There's dino kale. Those are the long, green, really wrinkly kale leaves. Then kale comes in curly form and they have purple kale in the curly form, green, that's the most common one you see. And and just buy a whole bunch of different varieties I recommend. Like I said, bring it home, prepare it and have it in the freezer for smoothies because it's just, that's been a life-changing thing for me. 
Yeah, it's like uh, green ice, right? You may as well add in a frozen veggie as your ice to uh, to put it in. And often when people are concerned that they've either purchased too many greens and they don't know what to do with them, you know, Jesse, you might take some at the beginning of the week and some people might realize what I try and encourage people is that towards the end of the week or when you feel like you don't know if you're going to use it and it might start to turn, that's also a good time to freeze it and that way you don't have to worry about it or you're going on vacation and you have some extra green veggies. So either way, yeah, pop some in your freezer and then use it in different recipes. So I mentioned juices, smoothies, and then another area too is dinner meals. So entrees, chopping it up and throwing it into a stir fry or a soup or a pasta. People always ask, I don't know what to do with kale. It's so complicated to work with. It's really not. Once you chop it up just like you would any other, you know, green like spinach, which most people are comfortable with, you can just throw it in towards the end of cooking so that you can keep it green, keep it vibrant and uh, get the most nourishment out of it and uh, just add it to meals and just kick up that meal. It can be very, very simple to prep or you can always saute it on the side. And another thing I'm going to mention is to rotate your greens. So we're talking a lot about kale because kale's you know, getting so much attention right now, but you want to change things up. You want to try things like Swiss chard, collard greens, get some of the other leafies in there and get a rotation going so that you're not stuck on one. Your body can become dependent on it. Worst case scenario, you develop an allergy or you just get bored of it, whatever that might be. So I really encourage you to uh, to swap out your greens, buy a couple during the week and sh- interchange them or buy one week, one green, another week, another green. Okay, finishing up on the kale, one other point I want to make, this is when you're dealing with fresh kale and you're going to make a fresh kale salad or prep it to put on sandwiches. You want to really use some muscle and mechanically break the kale down. So what Marty and I like to do, kale salad is one of our favorite things. We have it as a side or sometimes we'll just have it as a meal. What you want to do is de-stem kale. That's one thing we should have mentioned before. Kale stems are really fibrous. They don't taste very good. I personally de-stem all my kale before I freeze it, going back to what I was talking about before. But in this case, so you're going to make a kale salad, you de-stem the kale and then you chop it up as fine as you like. I mean, smaller is better because kale is so hearty and it requires a lot of chewing. But then once you get it to the desired size, throw it all in a big bowl, add some olive oil or hemp oil or whatever you're going to use in the salad. Add some apple cider vinegar or lemon juice, whatever soury acid you're going to use in your dressing, and just get in there with your hands for five minutes and massage and break that down because that can be the difference between having a really delicious kale salad that you enjoy or making a kale salad and being turned off from that because it's just so hard to chew and it's just so fibrous in your mouth. So that's that's a tip that Marnie and I have been implementing for a while now. And, and we, again, love our kale salads. Absolutely. If you don't have access to fresh greens or it's the winter time or you're looking to you know get some other varieties in this brings us to our next green food and that's green powders so you know you've heard jesse and i if you've been listening to all the podcasts you know that there's a couple that we're a fan of because there's a lot out there you know in health food stores and anywhere else that aren't good for you so you want to get good quality greens powders and this is in addition to getting the fresh greens in but again should there be a day or a time when you're traveling or spaces in between that you need to kind of boost up and and get some good greens in and all the benefits that they offer is getting a good quality greens powder. We love the Ormus Super Greens from Sun Warrior. You've heard us talk about it. We love it. It's wonderful. It's great. You can add it to your morning elixir. Maybe you're making morning elixirs by now. You can add it to some water. You can just sip on it throughout the day, throw it into a smoothie. Really, really easy. And you can also get single sourced greens as well too. Anything from spirulina to chlorella to E3 Live, Blue Green Algae, and uh, there's, there's so many out there. And we also obviously have to mention Health Force, Vita Mineral Green. That one I've been using for years. Love it. I mentioned it on numerous podcasts in the past, but uh, we can't talk about green powders and not mention that one. It's It's amazing. There's so many amazing greens mixed into one product, probiotics, The company is so hardcore about everything they're doing. It's in brown glass. And 
Yeah, no, it's just, it's awesome. Like Barney said, there's so many. The majority of stuff you're going to buy at your health food store is going to be junky. It's going to be detrimental to your health. It's really, I know it's tough, like a lot of things in the health world, sorting out the good from the bad, but make sure you know the brands you're buying from and you can feel really confident that you're putting your money to good use. And and Marnie and I have been in this world for a long time and we've tried most of the brands and uh, you can really trust the ones that we're, we're continuing to use till this day. Absolutely. And the way to, to, to look at some of these greens too is that they're nature's multivitamin. That's how I want you to start to look at green leafy vegetables that we've been talking about all the way to the green powders. If you are going to give up your multivitamin and switch over to a greens powder, you're doing yourself really good because it's so comprehensive and so well-rounded and it's alkalizing and uh, blood building and nourishing and it just makes you feel good. So that's uh that's all I have to say right now in greens powders. (laughs) Yeah, and they're whole food powders. They're not just isolated formulated in a lab chemicals that are the same molecular structure as whole foods. These are actually foods that have been dehydrated at low temperatures and still have all the integrity of the whole food. So yeah, green powders definitely have one at all times and they're just insurance for maintaining great health. All right. So let's move into another, uh, another green food that we love and that's broccoli. As uh, as old school and as kind of overused and overnamed broccoli is, it really is a superfood. And uh, we're going to get into that and talk about why it's so wonderful and how you can actually kind of take broccoli out of contacts. Actually, even recently, I was making dinner for Jesse and I, and I was just chopping up broccoli. And I actually hadn't purchased broccoli for dinner for one of our dinners in a long time. I just, I don't know, it just wasn't going towards it. So I was steaming it. And then Jesse had the brilliant idea for me to blend up broccoli and put it on our pasta. And I ended up making this delicious broccoli puree to put it onto pasta. So it just goes to show there's so many different ways than just having it as a straight up side dish. Let's get into the nutrients and uh, why it's so good for us. Well, yeah, like back to what you're just saying, make sure you're being creative in the kitchen. That just kind of came to me while we were putting together dinner together and it turned out amazing. It was like a broccoli pesto on our whole grain pasta. We've mentioned in the past, there's there's great pot. When we say pasta, we're not talking about white pasta or whole wheat pasta. There's some great pastas out there made from things such as lentils, quinoa, brown rice. And those are the type of pastas we're talking about. Yep. They're so good. And honestly, we have, I know I have in my cooking classes, convinced so many people to swap out their pasta to a brown rice pasta because it actually looks like white pasta, but it's got all the fiber and the protein in it. So it's a really, really easy swap out. So broccoli, you can puree it. You can put it into soup. You can put it into, you can steam it on the side. If you want to be hardcore, you can even juice the stems of broccoli. And you're getting vitamin C. You're getting calcium. You're getting chlorophyll. There's protein in broccoli too. And that's often overlooked in so many green foods and even in the plant world. And you've probably heard us talk about it again in one of our previous episodes, talking about the protein that's found in plant-based foods. But certainly broccoli is a powerhouse for protein. Broccoli along with kale, cabbage, cauliflower, collards, just to name a few, are cruciferous vegetables. And there's a couple things to keep in mind when consuming these. Yeah, these are veggies that can be a little bit harsher to digest. So as Jesse was mentioning earlier, like when it comes to preparing and uh, working with kale, marinating it, putting some oil on it, some vinegar on it, breaking it down is a lot easier. So same thing when it comes to things like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, collards, you want to get these guys either steamed or... Or you want to, if you're going to follow a raw foods diet, if that's what works for you, you want to get these guys chopped up really small or marinated in some kind of oil or vinegar. So by breaking that down, that allows your body to digest them and assimilate them and not have the same reactions that you would if you were to just pick up a raw piece of broccoli, which is often found on a vegetable platter, which can cause a lot of gas and bloating and discomfort. And then there are some people who can experience some thyroid problems more on an internal level Um, with some of these vegetables. So you just want to be mindful of that and watch how you're preparing cruciferous veggies. 
Right. I'm sure we've all felt that when you've had too much raw broccoli when you're at a party and there's a dish of veggies out and your stomach just starts rumbling later, you feel gassy. Sometimes it just doesn't digest that well. So great points. Next thing we're going to get into is one of our favorite green vegetables. Actually, is an avocado a vegetable or a fruit? It's a fruit. It's got a big pit in it. So that uh, puts it as a fruit. I know a lot of people think because most people have it with savory things. So they just classify it as a veggie, but it is a fruit. There are some amazing things you can do with avocado. I had never done this until I met Marnie and she puts together a rockin' chocolate pudding with avocado. And yeah, most people think savory when they think avocado, but this sweet dessert that she's made a number of times, it's amazing. And if you want the recipe to that, I uh, suggest that you get plant-based diet for dummies because it's in there. And uh, it, it is an amazing recipe. I have served it at many a party, a cooking class, or even just for friends. And people cannot believe that the texture, that's really what this pudding is all about, is the texture of the avocado mimicking like a yogurt or a cream. And then you throw some chocolate in there and some maple syrup or honey and uh, doctor it up and it's delicious. So that's my sweet creation. And Jess, you're savory creation is your epic guacamole. Yeah, this is what I'm most known for in the kitchen. I've kind of perfected this recipe over the years. And yeah, I love guacamole. You can get that recipe for free. Head over, just just type my name and guacamole and it'll come up in Google or we will put a link in the show notes too. So check out the recipe I, I've come up with. But guacamole is amazing. Such a hearty dish and it's great for bringing to parties everybody tends to love it and what we'll do with guacamole is we'll make our own chips in the oven so we take tortillas like a sprouted grain tortilla cut it up into wedges spread a little bit of olive oil put a little sea salt maybe some paprika bake those up in the oven and you have some nice crispy chips or you just take fresh cut up veggies and you can dip it in there and yeah guacamole is amazing And kind of on the same page as guacamole is taking an avocado. Obviously, you're going to depit it, take the skin off, scoop it into a bowl, mash it up with a fork, and it makes basically an amazing vegan mayonnaise. So Marty and I, when we make sandwiches, we don't have them a ton, but we use the Ezekiel sprouted grain bread. And we'll use the mashed up avocado as a spread over that in our sandwiches if we're making, I don't know, tomato sandwich or some kind of amazing sandwich, especially now we have them a little bit more now that all the produce is amazing this time of year. But yeah, use the avocado mashed up as a spread. It'll make your sandwiches creamy, amazing. You will thank me later. It is so good. And another thing that uh, to use avocado on is on your kale salad or on any kind of uh, salad greens. You can use it as the creamy base of your dressing instead of using egg or cream or anything that would be creamy. So avocado is amazing on a salad. And also adding avocado to a smoothie to cream up your smoothie is really amazing too, whether you're making a sweet smoothie or a savory smoothie. Yeah, and on Marnie's first point there, when we talked about marinating the kale salad and mashing it all up, just throw half an avocado or actually a full avocado, depending on the size of the salad, just mash it in there with those other ingredients and I'll put like a thick creaminess all over the kale. Delicious salad. It's it's so good. Also, just for a quick snack, you can take an avocado, just cut it open and sprinkle some sea salt on it and just have it as a as a nice delicious snack. So why are avos so good for us? They have vitamin E, they have protein, good healthy fat. They are incredible for your skin, hair and nails. And you can people are still fearful of eating avocados because of the fat content. Please don't. Enjoy them in moderation. The only downfall to avocados is that they don't grow in our backyard here where we live in North America. So if you're listening, if you're tuning in North America, then uh, that is the problem we face and that is about it i wish they were local but uh other than that enjoy them in moderation and uh and make sure that the skin is darker because if it's green it's not ripe yet so you want to make sure that the skin is kind of a purplish dark kind of brownish color and you can just kind of press it in and then it's ready to go and then you can enjoy it and it's great for the skin too you can put it on your face or in your hair for an incredible moisturizer 
Yeah, that's some great ideas there. And I think a lot of people do have trouble picking out a ripe avocado. And, and if it's not perfectly ripe, a lot of times your your food will taste really starchy and, and they taste pretty terrible. So that's great. And yeah, just save save a little cube of your avocado when you're making your salad or sandwich. And like Marnie said, spread it all over your skin. Oh, and I'll just add in one more tip is, you know, the next question is how do we keep the avocado that we cut in half uh, from oxidizing and going brown? Depends on how ripe the avocado is. The more ripe it is, the quicker it is to brown. But if it's like kind of the perfect ripeness and you squeeze some lemon juice on it and put it into a sealed glass container, you should be able to keep it for at least a day or two. And I know some people too, I'm just, I've been seeing some stuff online about putting it in a sealed container with some onion has also shown to uh, prevent it from oxidizing. So that's another little tip. Yeah. And one thing about avocados, I've heard there's a number of different varieties. I've seen a couple. The kind that we typically find here in Ontario is the Haas avocado. As you can see, Marnie and I are passionate about our avocado. Marnie, have you have you delved into any other varieties of avocado that you want to share that you've had a good experience with? I can't remember the name right now. I'll have to look it up. We can put it in the show notes. But when I was out in Africa a couple of years ago, such unique avocados. They tasted like, they tasted more like a fruit. They were actually so big and pear-like that they were almost more watery, believe it or not, for an avocado. They were so different than the uh, avocados you get here in North America. We're going to get into a couple of our other favorite greens. And for me, these greens are a favorite in juice form. I'm not the biggest fan of celery and cucumber, like eating them raw or including them in salads and such. I mean, a village Greek salad is an exception for the cucumber, but typically I like these as the base of my green juices. They work so good as a base. There's not as much sugar as a lot of people like to use beet or carrot. And again, in moderation, those can make great bases for fresh juice. But I find my all-time favorite Drank a lot of juice throughout my life, and I love a good celery cucumber base. So try that out. Garnish it by putting other things in the juice to accentuate the flavors. But uh, yeah, they make a great base. Love them in a juice. And it's nice because celery is a little bit more salty and cucumber is a little bit more sweet, and they're both so loaded with water. So they're just such a nice uh, mineral-rich, electrolyte-rich uh, way to have it as a base of a, as a base of a juice. And I do love cucumber. I've always loved cucumber. I love snacking on it, eating it. And it's really interesting because cucumber and, uh, and pickles are – interchangeable and Jesse is the pickle fan of the two of us and I'm the cucumber fan so it's kind of kind of interesting just want to bring that up <laughs> <laughs> let's get into sea vegetables these aren't always green but a lot of them are and they're just an amazing superfood that you can incorporate in small amounts throughout your diet and you get such a great nutrition punch from these and they provide iodine too which is an essential nutrient that can be hard to get throughout the diet. The typical way people are getting iodine these days is through table salt. It's been fortified, added in. Marnie and I are both not fans of including regular table salt into the diet. There's amazing Himalayan pink salts and other great sea salts. Yeah, and seaweeds are also loaded with trace minerals and chlorophyll. They're great for detoxifying the body. So you can add them in in small amounts in different ways uh, throughout the week. They're a condiment. That's how you want to look at them is you can prepare seaweeds, you can soak them and use things like arame, which just, you know, you, you buy most seaweeds dried and some of them you can soak and some of them you don't need to soak. Things like nori that you wrap sushi up with and dulse is a kind of purplish seaweed that you can just throw into salads. You don't need to soak those guys, but wakame and arame are definitely um, our soakers. And then you can use them into things like miso soup, stir fries, salads. They're so wonderful. Again, if you're looking to get into seaweeds, I do, if you do have plant-based diet for dummies or you want to get a copy, I have a whole section on all the different benefits of seaweeds, how to use them, incorporate them, and get to know kind of different recipes and ways of preparing them. 
So my favorite three types of seaweed or sea vegetables, sounds a little bit nicer, are dulse number one, nori number two, and that's the one like Barney mentioned can be wrapped around sushi and sometimes we'll make our own sushi and that's how we incorporate that one. And kelp is the other one. And kelp, there's actually kelp noodles that you can get and use them in salads. You could use them as a pasta noodle. You can use them in a variety of different ways. But my favorite way of getting kelp and dulcin is in flake form. So these seaweeds come in different forms and they come in small granules or flakes. And I like to just, instead of salt, use that a lot of times. You can upgrade basically, sea salt has a lot of great benefits and trace minerals, but to change it up and get some different variety in your diet, you can sprinkle them on salads or use them in other ways you would typically use sea salt. And one thing I should mention is that kelp noodles don't have the nutrients or the green or the chlorophyll left in them. They've been stripped of that. So really you're just getting this kind of almost like the gelatinous aspect of of what seaweeds are in a noodle form. So just so you know, when uh, Jesse mentioned kelp noodles there, you're not getting this nutrient-rich noodle. You're getting something that's just kind of somewhere in the middle. So my favorite seaweeds are arame, wakame. So arame, you can soak, and then I love to put that into salad sandwiches and to stir fries, or arame, some people call it. Wakame is often found in miso soup. Love it. And nori, of course. And what's awesome about nori these days is not only can you use it and make sushi, as we've talked about, but you can buy now nori chunks and little pieces from different companies like sea snacks and uh, you can have them on the go for a nice salty savory snack so it's an amazing snack and I see kids now eating it all the time instead of chips which is great so I know Jesse and I always keep some on hand for in you know in the moment quick uh, savory salty snack yeah and they come in different flavors my favorite's the wasabi it's so hot and delicious and you can get yeah, depending on your taste, they, they make a great snack and they come in different size pouches. So amazing to have around. All right. So let's get into the next category, and that is sprouts. So sprouts, such a big category because there's so many things that fall under sprouts. Everything from pea shoots to sunflower sprouts to radish sprouts to broccoli sprouts to you can sprout different grains, nuts, and seeds. But we're going to really just talk about kind of the green leafy sprouts that uh, that Jesse and I love so much. So what you're getting with something that is sprouted is a food that is now taken to the next level. You are getting a superfood. You are getting something that is so nutritionally power packed. So let's just say you take a sunflower seed and you put it into some soil and you let it develop a root system and then it grows into this sunflower sprout. You now have this sprout that has enzymes, protein, a whole whack of different trace minerals, and it helps you digest food And it's a living food. So the benefit of it being a living food means it's going to make you feel alive. It's going to add all those wonderful properties, not just what a raw food would add, but living foods is kind of the next level. So Jesse and I are all about next level foods. So definitely sprouts are next level foods. Yeah, just to get into that a little bit further, raw foods typically are foods that haven't been heated over 118 degrees. So those can be dehydrated Or, I mean, if you're just cutting up produce, making a salad, obviously that's not going to be heated. But with these, they're still alive or they've just been cut, like Marnie said, if you're growing them in soil and they still contain that life force and it really adds a whole nother element to your diet. So we recommend getting sprouts in and we're going to talk about some different kinds of sprouts and easy ways that you can start sprouting if you haven't done so already. But the biggest thing is get some sprouts in your diet on a regular basis. Grocery stores, health food stores, now we're seeing organic sprouts there too. There's just different ways depending on what works for you. Yeah, it's really easy to get your hands on sprouts, as Jesse just said, you know, different farmers markets. So if you just want to start buying them and getting them in, that's great. And if you want to take it on at home, it's super easy. It's something that you just need to do and then you realize how easy it is. And if you've got kids at home, they love kind of seeing the germination process. So what you need to do is get yourself some seeds and you you can pick different ones. So mung bean is a really easy way to start or broccoli seeds or radish. Grab some seeds, 
grab a glass jar, get yourself a mesh cheesecloth or a lid that's got a screen in it. And the first step is you need to soak those seeds. They need to soak for a good eight to 10 hours in water, submerged. And then the next step is that you rinse those seeds, you drain that water out, give those seeds a rinse, and then let it sit in a damp environment such as that jar, or you can put it into a colander, whatever works for you. And then they just sit and aerate, but they're still kind of moist and wet. But you want to make sure that they get rinsed really well just to prevent any mold growth. Then from there, after about five to eight hours, you rinse them again And the smaller the seed is, the faster it will germinate. So a broccoli or a radish sprout or a seed will will sprout really fast, whereas a chickpea or something bigger or a bigger, uh, you know, type of seed, essentially, is going to take a, a little bit longer to start to sprout. So once you start to see that sprout germinate outside of it, and when it's the size of what it is that you are using it's definitely ready. And then you just see that little shoot growing and then you can start to utilize them. Ways of using them, put them over salads. That's the easiest way. If you make wraps, you can put them in wraps, sandwiches. You can juice them. Amazing way to get a lot of sprouts in. And the beautiful thing about sprouts when you're making them, they're so cheap and they're going to expand so much in that jar in such a short period of time. Doing it at home, like Marnie said, get the kids involved. They're going to have fun with it. They're going to want to consume them. Yeah, sprouting can really take your health to the next level. Yeah, and then if you want to make an investment, and this is something I have in my studio, so if there's any listeners that have been to my food studio in Toronto, I have something called an urban cultivator. And you may have heard of it because it's been on uh, Dragon's Den and it's gotten some really good uh, attention. It is a sprout growing box. It's not a fridge because it's not cold. It's definitely got a humidity uh, aspect to it. But you can have trays of soil in there. So they are sprouts that are, let me make a distinction here. There's some sprouts that you can grow on your countertop, like I just said, that we can germinate in a glass jar. And then there's some sprouts that do require some soil. So, you know, and again, Jesse and I will, will put a link to uh, some resources that can help you decipher this. This urban cultivator, you have a soil system and then a root grows down and then you have all these beautiful microgreens and sprouts and it's all controlled for you. So it's a beautiful piece of equipment that you can get for your kitchen if this is something that you really want to get into and also save money and get the most nutrients out of your food because they're an amazing superfood. And I know people love the look of it. Every time I've been in the studio and people come in and they hadn't been in before, they always gravitate towards this Again, it looks like a small fridge with a glass front. So you can see all the sprouts growing and it's just just really beautiful in a kitchen. Yes, I love it. I love it. All right, so let's talk about kiwi. So kiwi is a, another green food that I find is often underlooked or underused or undereaten because... I don't know. I just, even myself, every once in a while, I'll get a craving for a kiwi and I'll realize just how delicious they are. Kiwis are high in vitamin C. They have this delicious sour taste to them. So if you don't want a sweet fruit and you kind of have a craving for something kind of cold and wet and juicy, go for a kiwi or a green apple even to put, I've done a a salad before with a green apple and a kiwi. So nice just to hit that kind of sourness. We don't get sour that often enough in our taste, uh, palette or profile. So if we can dive into a kiwi and the easiest way to eat it is to just slice it in half, stick a spoon in it and scoop them out. Or of course you can uh, go ahead and peel them and slice them into a salad. And I do know some people who eat the skin, a little too fuzzy for my palate, but I do know some people who eat the skin. Yeah. I think one of the most beautiful things is the simplicity. Kids love to eat them. You can cut them in half, send them in the kid's lunch or bring them whole to work and then just cut it in half when you need a snack during the day. Probably do a couple at once because they are fairly small, but they make a great snack. They're portable. Bananas are the same way. Avocados are the same way. They're naturally wrapped and you can just take them with you and, and have snacks on the go. Okay, getting towards the end of our list of greens here. Let's talk about cilantro and parsley. These are amazing dark deep greens and they have a special benefit of chelating metals from the body so they can help remove heavy metals from your system and you're going to expel them 
they provide so many benefits, same as the other greens, high in chlorophyll, vitamins, minerals, and they have that extra special property. I know myself, I like them both in small amounts. They're both really potent greens and they both have really unique tastes, but I do enjoy both of them in in small amounts. And I can really just say that I am a fan of parsley. Cilantro and me are not friends at all. And I'm sure I've got some people uh, listening right now that are on my side and do not like cilantro because it is one of those love or hate things. And it's something with the taste buds in the palate. And it just, for me, it doesn't taste like soap. I know a lot of people say that, but it's just not pleasant in my mouth. So I do not like cilantro. I can appreciate its benefits, the antioxidants, anti-inflammatory properties, all those wonderful things. But I love parsley. So the way that these guys are typically used is as garnishes or, you know, kind of accents to things. But I think they're also overlooked as to how nutrient dense they are. So adding them into salad dressings, putting them into juices, of course, putting them into salads like a tabbouleh salad. So using these guys chopped up, so I know cilantro is used a lot in Mexican cuisine and uh, Thai cuisine, and parsley is just kind of used everywhere. So use these guys up, get the nutritional benefit out of them. And parsley is actually also good for a breath cleanser. So for dogs too, and uh, for us humans, uh, eating, munching on some parsley is really good for the breath. Yeah. I remember back in the day seeing little sprigs of parsley sometimes when you go out to eat on the side of the plate, but I don't know if that's something that kind of died with the times, but I, I don't really see that anymore. Well, kale too is often used as a garnish and like <laughs> I've been known to like be grabbing the garnishes at uh, functions, family functions that are on the side of the plate and eating those <laughs> instead of what's actually on the platter. <laughs> nice. So the last green food we're going to talk about is a little bit different than the rest because it's a seed and this seed is pumpkin seed. I personally love pumpkin seeds. I sometimes just grab a handful from the cupboard and slam them down as a snack. They go well in trail mixes. Another awesome thing, if you can find it, instead of nut butter, like have your nut butters, even have a couple different nut butters going in the fridge so you can have the variety, the taste difference, nutrient difference. But if you're lucky, you can find a pumpkin seed butter and it's just got that vibrant green color. It's delicious. And I'll let Marnie talk about some of the other benefits of pumpkin seeds. Yeah, pumpkin seeds, they have such a unique flavor to them. I love them. And yeah, as a nut butter or even as an oil, pumpkin seed oil is delicious on salads. It's got this kind of nutty creaminess to it that's really addicting. So definitely try pumpkin seeds if you're not using them already and try the other varieties too. But pumpkin seeds are high in zinc, which is great for everyone. We all need more zinc in our diet and they're certainly good for males and uh, a certain part of their body. Pumpkin seeds are also a great uh, source of magnesium. So they're great for the nervous system. They have a solid amount of protein in them as well. And they also have been used as um, for intestinal parasites too. So there's some wonderful pumpkin seed uh, derivatives that have been used for people who have parasites. I just also want to mention that often pumpkin seeds are labeled as pepitas. So if you have, uh, if you've seen that before, or if you've seen it on a menu and you've seen the word pepitas before, that means pumpkin seeds. Little little fun fact. All right, so that wraps up our list of our some of our favorite green foods. We love a ton of different green foods. Greens are some of our favorite foods. And again, if I had to pick my favorite right off the top of my head, I would say kale. What would yours be, Marn? Probably kale. <laughs> <laughs> we both enjoy good kale salad, so it makes for an easy dinner after a long day. Looking forward to actually some kale tonight. Maybe we'll get a pizza or something or make a pizza and put some kale on it. I'm craving some kale now. <laughs> you better clarify for the listeners what you mean by having a pizza. By They're having probably- a pizza, I mean like a a spelt pizza with lots of veggies on it. Often Jesse and I just really do like a big veggie pizza. Sometimes we'll get a little bit of goat cheese or or avocado. You can use avocado as a, as the cheese as well too. It's nice and creamy and delicious. So if we don't make our own at home from scratch, which we love to do, there's some wonderful places in Toronto, one in particular called Magic Oven, that you can kind of build your own pizza and you can also get gluten-free crust as well too. So I think that's kind of, I know we're, we're getting hungry here. It's eight o'clock and I think... <laughs> 
I think that's where my mind is going right now. Yeah, so we're going to wrap things up. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. It was a little bit different than some of the stuff we've done in the past, and it was nice to get on the mic and just just talk. Marnie and I, it's nice to have that in the mix too. So I had a blast. What about you, Marn? Absolutely. I always have fun talking about food and and all these wonderful tips that we always share. So this is kind of a good time to put it out to you guys. If you have ideas for topics for Jesse and I for our own shows or for experts, health experts out there that you love and think would be a great guest on our show, you can either share it with us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or for a direct connection is to email us at contact at ultimatehealthpodcast.com. That way we can kind of hear what you guys want to listen to. We would love, you know, just we have a lineup of amazing guests coming up over the next couple of months, but maybe, you know, someone who you suggest is someone we already have, but we would love to know who you guys want. So please share with us and that's just going to help uh, make our show more catered to you, our listeners. And since a big part of our show is talking about our favorite greens, what we'd like you guys to do is during the week when you're consuming one of your favorite green foods, take a picture and tag on Instagram at Ultimate Health Podcast. That way we can see what some of your favorite greens are. We can interact over there. And we'll reshare it. We'll definitely reshare uh, your picture because we want to see what you guys are doing and we love hearing from you guys. This is this is why we created our show for you. So get out there and interact with us. And we also want to kind of push you a little bit to if you're not eating greens or green foods to eat more of them. So we want to see this is our this is our takeaway for today. We're asking you to eat something green and show us what you're having. And hopefully it's uh, it's awesome. And one little thing I want to add to that, if you haven't made your own sprouts at home, start simple, like Marnie described, grab a jar, put some cheesecloth over the top, throw in some of these these seeds she mentioned, such as broccoli, or what were the other ones that work for that? Uh, Broccoli, radish, you could do lentil, makes wonderful sprouts, even though it's not totally green, but you can do lentil and mung bean. Mung bean's green, and they make the best sprouts and the easiest sprouts. Mung beans are foolproof. So I think start with mung beans. Honestly, you could do this today, tomorrow, and over the next few days, you'll see them grow and and you could have sprouts fresh for your salads for the weekend. So definitely give that a try. And another thing we're thinking of doing, we've been talking about this for a while, and I think we're going to jump on it pretty soon, is... We're going to get this plug in for our website where you guys can call in and ask us questions and that way we can play it on the show and yeah, you can be heard and and you can ask whatever you want and Marnie and I, we're thinking we have some different ideas. We might open it up and you guys can ask questions for some of the guests. We'll tell you who's coming up and uh, you can get involved that way or we might answer one each show directed at us or we might do a whole show of Q&A. We, we have a lot of different ideas for this show and, and this is something we've really been getting excited about lately. So I think you guys will like that. I mean, how can you not? You're going to get to hear your voice on Ultimate Health Podcast. Yeah. And in the meantime, you know, just so that you know, you can email us and connect with us through any of our you know, platforms and ask us questions. And that way, you know, we can answer them and we'll start answering them, whether it's on a show directly or indirectly, whether we do it through the podcast or we will get back to you ourselves and email you. So don't feel like uh, the only way to uh, be in touch with us is just through listening. We want to connect with you directly. Okay, guys. So we're going to wrap things up. Make sure you take that picture of your greens, tag us in it. If you haven't gotten your sprouts going at home before, try that out. You're going to really embrace that, I'm sure, and make it part of your healthy routine. And we just want to say thank you, everybody that participated in this contest over the last couple of weeks. We got some amazing reviews. Like Marnie said, we do this show for you guys, and it's so nice to see that it's impacting and helping you guys in so many ways. So... Please, if you haven't already, take that minute, 
let us know how we're doing. Head over to iTunes, leave us a rating and review. I know we keep saying it, but it's really important to us and it's going to get this show seen by a lot more people. So thank you. And we will be talking to you guys soon. Have a great week. Yeah, and I just want to say we will have other contests down the road. So don't be discouraged if you didn't win this time. We've got actually a whole bunch of other awesome products lined up that we're going to be doing some other contests with. So keep up the reviews. Keep up the listening. Thank you again, guys, and have an amazing week. We appreciate you guys, and thanks for listening. Take care. Bye.